Hello everyone, I am Mohammed Hamama, and this is your ASCP Preparation Camp. In this camp, we will go through each topic on the ASCP lecture list. In today's video, we delve into normal hemostasis and coagulation. In this video, we'll dive deep into the intricate world of hemostasis, the remarkable natural process that keeps our blood flowing while safeguarding us from excessive bleeding and abnormal blood clotting. Understanding these critical mechanisms is essential for your health. Let's get started. Hemostasis is a complex, natural process that ensures our blood remains in a liquid state, preventing excessive bleeding and responding to injuries. It's like our body's own emergency response system. However, when this system malfunctions, it can lead to life-threatening conditions, hemorrhage, which is excessive bleeding, or thrombosis, which is abnormal blood clotting. Imagine how vital each plasma procoagulant is for maintaining this delicate balance. Even the absence of a single procoagulant can result in a lifetime of severe bleeding, chronic inflammation, and the need for frequent blood transfusions. We'll explore the critical roles of these substances in detail. On the flip side, control proteins play an equally crucial role. Without them, our blood clotting process can go unchecked, leading to issues like thrombosis, stroke, pulmonary embolism, deep vein thrombosis, and cardiovascular problems. We'll delve deep into their functions and consequences. To understand hemostasis, you need to know its major players, blood vessels, platelets, and plasma proteins. These elements work together in harmony, orchestrating a symphony of responses that maintain our health. It's essential not only for interpreting lab results but also for preventing, predicting, diagnosing, and managing clotting and bleeding disorders. Hemostasis is our body's way of stopping bleeding when we're injured. It involves vasoconstriction, platelet adhesion and aggregation, and the activation of coagulation enzymes. Think of it as turning a small signal, be it physical or chemical, into a life-saving event. It's a complex process that involves cellular elements like vascular cells, tissue factor-bearing cells, and platelets, along with plasma components like coagulation and fibrinolytic proteins. Primary hemostasis. This is where the real action happens, as blood vessels and platelets respond to injuries and damaged endothelial cells. When an injury or damaged endothelial cells are detected, blood vessels swiftly narrow their diameter, a process known as vasoconstriction. This narrowing reduces blood flow, acting as a quick and effective measure to prevent excessive bleeding. Simultaneously, platelets spring into action. They become active, swiftly moving to the injury site. These platelets release their contents, including factors that encourage clot formation. The result? A platelet plug starts to form, like the first line of defense against bleeding. While primary hemostasis offers a rapid response to vessel damage, it's not always enough to control significant bleeding. To strengthen this initial plug, we need the involvement of a critical player, fibrin. Think of it as a reinforcement, making sure the clot stays intact. Problems in primary hemostasis can spell trouble. Conditions like collagen issues, low platelet counts, platelet quality problems, or von Willebrand disease can lead to severe, and sometimes deadly, ongoing bleeding. It's a reminder of how crucial this primary phase is. Now, let's switch gears to secondary hemostasis. This phase focuses on the activation of various plasma coagulation proteins. Most of these proteins are serine proteases, which play a central role in creating a fibrin clot. These proteins start as inactive zymogens or proenzymes and become active during the coagulation process. They work together, forming complexes that activate other zymogens. The ultimate goal is to produce thrombin, a critical enzyme that converts fibrinogen into a localized fibrin clot. It's a pivotal step in maintaining the integrity of your blood vessels. The story of hemostasis doesn't end there. The final act is known as fibrinolysis. During this phase, the body gradually breaks down and removes the fibrin clot. It's a necessary step in the healing process. In the intricate world of hemostasis, primary and secondary systems don't work in isolation. Instead, they interact in the early and late stages of this process. For instance, platelets, a crucial part of primary hemostasis, also release coagulation factors stored in their granules. They provide a vital cell membrane component for coagulation complexes to form. In this segment, we'll explore the unsung hero of the process, the vascular intima. So, what is the vascular intima? Think of it as the guardian between your circulating blood and the delicate body tissues. It's made up of a single layer of dynamic endothelial cells, often referred to as EC, which form the innermost lining of blood vessels. 
These endothelial cells are like versatile actors, with their roles shifting based on where they're located and what your body needs. They're not just found in different types of blood vessels, like arteries and veins, but also in various tissues and organs throughout your body. Endothelial cells are true multitaskers. They're involved in immune responses, controlling vascular permeability, cell growth, and playing a pivotal role in the complex process of hemostasis. Now, let's talk about the part you're here for, how the vascular intima is the unsung hero of hemostasis. Under normal conditions, this vital layer of endothelial cells acts as a natural protector against the formation of blood clots. It accomplishes this by putting the brakes on platelet clumping. The ECs make it challenging for platelets to get together and form the initial stages of a blood clot. These cells also prevent the activation and spread of blood clotting. It's like having an internal safety system that stops clot formation in its tracks. Moreover, the intact endothelial cells encourage the breakdown of fibrin, a protein that plays a central role in clot formation. They're like the cleanup crew after the performance. But there's more. The ECs help maintain a smooth inner surface in your blood vessels. This reduces turbulence, making it less likely for platelets and clotting factors to become activated. They create a physical barrier between the clot-promoting components in your blood and the vessel's collagen. This acts as a deterrent for platelet adhesion and clot formation. Endothelial cells don't stop there. They produce substances like prostacyclin and nitric oxide, which inhibit platelet activation and support overall healthy blood vessel function. They're also master regulators. ECs produce the tissue factor pathway inhibitor, TFPI, which helps control the activation of the coagulation pathway. Moreover, they synthesize and express inhibitors of thrombin formation, like thrombomodulin and heparin sulfate, which help keep the clotting process in check. Let's not forget the endothelial protein C receptor, or EPCR for short. This receptor interacts with protein C, a key player in coagulation control. This interaction catalyzes the activation of the protein C pathway, downregulating coagulation by breaking down activated factor V and 8, effectively inhibiting thrombin formation. Heparin sulfate, another molecule produced by ECs, enhances the activity of antithrombin, a serine protease inhibitor. Heparin, a pharmaceutical anticoagulant, shares similarities with EC-produced heparin sulfate and is used in medical treatment to prevent blood clot propagation. Procoagulant and fibrinolytic properties of the vascular intima. While the healthy vascular lining is skilled at preventing blood clots, when it's damaged, it can inadvertently become a catalyst for clot formation. Let's unravel how that happens. First off, any local injury, whether it's caused by physical trauma or a chemical reaction, triggers a protective response. Arteries and arterioles narrow, reducing blood flow to the wounded area. Even in veins and capillaries, bleeding into surrounding tissues helps limit blood loss. Next, the inner tissues of arteries and veins contain collagen, a flexible protein that binds and activates platelets. As we age, some natural wear and tear can make these vessels more prone to bruising. In response to certain triggers, endothelial cells release von Willebrand factor, VWF, from storage sites known as Weibel-Pilotti bodies. VWF is a critical glycoprotein that helps platelets adhere to the exposed collagen in arterioles. Moreover, activated endothelial cells release P-selectin, a molecule that encourages platelets and white blood cells to attach. They also release other adhesive molecules like intercellular adhesion molecules, ICOMs, and platelet endothelial cell adhesion molecules, PICAMs, which further enhance the binding of platelets and white blood cells. Finally, lurking within subendothelial smooth muscle cells and fibroblasts is tissue factor, a protein embedded in their membranes. Under normal circumstances, damage to the endothelial cells exposes this tissue factor, kicking off the clotting process by interacting with plasma factor 7. In some pathological conditions, tissue factor can also be found on circulating monocytes in cases of inflammation and sepsis, as well as on microparticles created from membrane fragments of activated or dying vascular cells. Endothelial cells are not just troublemakers, they also play a crucial role in a process called fibrinolysis. During the formation of a blood clot, both tissue plasminogen activator, TPA, and plasminogen make an appearance, attaching to the clotted fibrin. TPA takes center stage by converting plasminogen into plasmin, an enzyme that gradually breaks down fibrin, allowing blood flow to be restored. But wait, there's more. Endothelial cells contribute to the regulation of fibrinolysis by producing inhibitors that prevent excessive plasmin production. 
Plasminogen Activator Inhibitor 1, PAI-1, released by ECs and other cells, acts as a control protein for TPA, inhibiting plasmin generation and fibrinolysis. Another player, Thrombin Activatable Fibrinolysis Inhibitor, TAFI, is activated by thrombin bound to EC membranes containing thrombomodulin. Elevated levels of PAI-1 or TAFI can throw this delicate balance off kilter, slowing down fibrinolysis and increasing the risk of blood clot formation. So, we've explored the dynamic dual nature of the vascular intima. Recognizing its importance in the clotting process is well established. However, there are limited laboratory tests available to assess the condition of endothelial cells, smooth muscle cells, fibroblasts, and the collagen framework that they create. The diagnosis of blood vessel-related disorders typically relies on clinical symptoms, family medical history, and laboratory tests aimed at ruling out platelet or coagulation disorders. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel, activate notifications to get our new videos, if you like our content please press the like button, and share the video with your friends. If you have any questions leave a comment below. Platelets, these seemingly unassuming cellular fragments, play a vital role in the intricate dance of hemostasis. In this segment, we'll journey through their origin and the pivotal role they play in responding to injuries. First, let's take a closer look at platelet production. Platelets are not ordinary cells but are created from the cytoplasm of bone marrow megakaryocytes. Despite their petite size, typically 2 to 3 micrometers in diameter in blood films, platelets are complex and highly active cells that interact dynamically with their surroundings. They serve as key players in initiating and regulating blood clotting, or hemostasis. When an injury occurs, platelets spring into action with three main objectives, adhesion, aggregation, and granule release. Adhesion is the remarkable ability of platelets to stick to surfaces, not limited to platelet surfaces. They can even adhere to non-platelet surfaces like subendothelial collagen. This sticking is crucial during injuries, preventing excessive bleeding. Meet von Willebrand factor, or VWF, a molecular connector that plays a pivotal role in linking platelets to collagen. It's especially active in high-stress areas like arteries and arterioles. In damaged veins and capillaries, platelets can directly bind to collagen. VWF accomplishes this by binding to platelets through their glycoprotein membrane receptor. The significance of platelet adhesion becomes even clearer when we explore certain bleeding disorders. Conditions like bernard soulier syndrome, where the platelet receptor is absent, and von Willebrand disease, when VWF is either missing or not functioning properly, underscore the vital role of these adhesion processes. Aggregation is the process of platelets sticking together, essentially forming a clump. This happens when platelets are activated, receiving signals to unite. During activation, a transformation occurs in a specific part of platelets called the gpiib 3 a receptor. This change enables them to attach to substances such as fibrinogen, von Willebrand factor, VWF, and fibronectin. Fibrinogen, a critical protein, plays a central role in platelet aggregation. It connects to the gpiib 3 a receptors on neighboring platelets, essentially functioning as the glue that binds them together, especially when calcium is present. This binding process is pivotal for platelet clumping, or aggregation. To encourage platelets to clump together, researchers often use various substances known as agonists in laboratory studies, in vitro. These substances include thrombin, arachidonic acid, adenosine diphosphate, ADP, collagen, and epinephrine. They attach to specific receptors on platelets. Platelets release the contents of their granules as the process of aggregation unfolds. This release primarily occurs in the later stages of the activation process. Inside these tiny platelets, there's a treasure trove of elements that orchestrate clotting. Clotting factors like factor 5, VWF, and factor 8, substances that control clotting, like calcium and ADP, among others, are stored in their granules. ADP and calcium are key players in platelet activation. They kickstart an enzyme called phospholipase A2, leading to the transformation of a part of the platelet's membrane into arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid then gets a makeover, thanks to another enzyme, cyclooxygenase, which turns it into prostaglandin endoperoxides. Inside the platelet, there's an enzyme known as thromboxane synthetase, responsible for converting prostaglandins into thromboxane A2. The release of thromboxane A2 sets the stage for more calcium release, fueling platelet clumping and blood vessel narrowing, a process known as vasoconstriction. Aspirin, the familiar medication, steps into the scene by permanently inactivating cyclooxygenase. 
This, in turn, halts the production of thromboxane A2, impairing platelet function. It's often referred to as the aspirin effect. Platelets take center stage in forming coagulation enzyme cofactor substrate complexes, which are pivotal for blood clotting. They contribute calcium, a specific membrane component called phosphatidylserine, procoagulant factors, and receptors. The coagulation cascade begins on tissue factor-bearing cells like fibroblasts, involving the extrinsic tenase complex, a feedback loop that ultimately results in a burst of thrombin. The blood's ensemble cast includes erythrocytes, red blood cells, monocytes, and lymphocytes, each playing a role in maintaining hemostasis. Erythrocytes are key to clot structure and bulk, and a lack of them can lead to a higher tendency to bleed. In inflammatory conditions, monocytes, lymphocytes, and possibly endothelial cells carry tissue factor on their surfaces, capable of triggering the coagulation process. Leukocytes, the white blood cells, boast specific molecules on their surfaces, integrins and selectins. These molecules help them adhere to adhesion molecules and stimulate the production of inflammatory cytokines, aiding in the wound healing process. Welcome to a fascinating journey through the nomenclature of procoagulants, those remarkable factors that choreograph our blood's intricate dance of clotting. Let's delve into the details. Our blood contains a dynamic cast of at least 16 procoagulants or coagulation factors. Most of these are glycoproteins expertly crafted in the liver. Some, however, are produced by monocytes, endothelial cells, the linings of blood vessels, and megakaryocytes. Eight of these factors are enzymes, circulating in a covert state known as zymogens, waiting for their moment to shine. The others are the trusty cofactors, forming essential partnerships with these enzymes. Together, when activated, they're the maestros that craft localized blood clots, also known as thrombi. In the coagulation cascade, balance is everything. That's where the specific plasma glycoproteins come in. They act as guardians, ensuring the process doesn't tip the scales. In the world of procoagulants, names carry weight. Back in 1958, the International Committee for the Standardization of the Nomenclature of Blood Clotting Factors bestowed names upon these plasma procoagulants, christening them with Roman numerals. The order of discovery dictated their numbering. When a procoagulant takes center stage and is activated, a lowercase a is added to the numeral. For instance, activated factor 7 earns its spotlight as VIA. Some procoagulants have aliases. Factor I often goes by the name fibrinogen, while factor 2 is better known as prothrombin. Occasionally, they're addressed by their numerals. Factor 3, once linked to tissue thromboplastin, a mix of tissue factor and phospholipid, is a name less commonly used now, thanks to our deeper understanding of tissue factor structure. Factor 4 was bestowed upon the humble plasma cation, calcium, Ca2+. But we typically refer to it by its proper name or chemical symbol. Factor 6 had its moment but was later withdrawn from the naming system when it was found to be a masked identity of activated factor 5. Factor 8, also known as the antihemophilic factor, doesn't travel alone. It's accompanied by a trusty sidekick, the large carrier protein called VWF, von Willebrand factor. In the world of Roman numerals, not all find a place. Precolicrian and high molecular weight caninogen, HMWK, remain unnumbered, as they have their own allegiances within the calocrine and kinin systems. Platelet phospholipids, particularly phosphatidylserine, play crucial roles in the coagulation process. Yet, they bear no Roman numeral designation. In the past, they were collectively known as platelet factor 3. Now we're diving deep into the classification and function of procoagulants, those remarkable characters in the blood's clotting drama. Our procoagulant cast can be categorized into two main types, serine proteases and cofactors. But there's always an exception, and that's our star, factor 13, a transglutaminase. Serine proteases, part of the illustrious trypsin enzyme family, include headliners like thrombin, activated factor 7, activated factor 9, activated factor 10, activated factor 11, activated factor 12, and pre-K. They all wield a specific amino acid, serine, in their active sites. Their mission? Breaking peptide bonds, dismantling the primary structure, and creating smaller polypeptide fragments. They start as humble zymogens, single peptide chains waiting for their moment to shine. Their big break? Another protease cleaving them at specific sites during the coagulation process. Enter the procoagulant cofactors, the unsung heroes in the coagulation narrative. We've got tissue factor, the character gracing the membranes of fibroblasts and smooth muscle cells. 
Then there are the soluble plasma stars, factor 5, 8, and high molecular weight caninogen, HMWK. Of course, the coagulation pathway wouldn't be complete without its supporting characters, fibrinogen, factor 13, phospholipids, calcium, and von Willebrand factor, VWF. They play their roles in the grand coagulation tail. In the real world of clinical practice, understanding the molecular weights, plasma concentrations, and half-lives of these procoagulants is paramount. It's the key to deciphering lab tests, orchestrating anticoagulant therapies, and crafting effective replacement therapies for conditions that involve deficiency-related bleeding. Take factor 8, for instance, with its short 12-hour half-life. Individuals with hemophilia, lacking this factor, require replacement therapy every 12 hours. It's their lifeline. Knowing that a factor level of 25% to 30% is considered sufficient for hemostasis, preventing bleeding, in factor-deficient patients is like knowing the secret formula for clotting success. In the world of anticoagulant therapies, especially with medications like warfarin, coumadin, understanding the different half-lives of coagulation factors is paramount. Factor 7 decreases within 6 hours, while prothrombin reduction takes 4 to 5 days. That's why it takes about 5 days for the full anticoagulant effect of warfarin to kick in. Next we're unraveling the secrets of the vitamin K-dependent prothrombin group, a fascinating ensemble of characters. Our cast of the vitamin K-dependent prothrombin group includes stars like prothrombin, factor 2, and factor 7, 9, and 10. They're joined by regulatory proteins protein C, protein S, and protein Z. You could say they're all part of the same family, and they've got a specific job, keeping our bloods balance. They're known as the prothrombin group because, in terms of structure, they resemble prothrombin, the precursor to thrombin, a central character in the clotting storyline. Meet our behind-the-scenes hero, vitamin K. This quinone can be found in green leafy vegetables and is produced by certain intestinal organisms. These proteins rely on vitamin K for their proper function, ensuring they perform their roles flawlessly. While fibrinogen, not part of the prothrombin group, forms the primary structural protein in a fibrin clot, factor 13 steps in to strengthen and stabilize the clot. Together, they create the magic behind clot formation. In the grand coagulation spectacle, calcium takes center stage. It's a vital component in the formation of coagulation complexes on platelet or cell membranes. These complexes are the key players in blood clotting. With the help of positively charged calcium ions, serine proteases, the clotting enzymes, attached to negatively charged phospholipids, primarily phosphatidylserine. This elegant dance happens precisely at the site of an injury, all under the tight control of regulatory mechanisms. Here's where vitamin K's special talents shine. It modifies proteins within the prothrombin group through gamma carboxylation, turning glutamic acid into gamma carboxyglutamic acid. This transformation enables these proteins to bind to ionic calcium, Ca2+, ensuring their active participation in the coagulation complexes. But what happens when there's a vitamin K deficiency or when someone's taking warfarin, a vitamin K antagonist? Well, the story takes a different turn. The vitamin K-dependent procoagulants are produced without gamma carboxylation, creating the gamma carboxyl proteins or PIVCAs. These proteins, while still in the plot, can't effectively participate in the coagulation process. It's the basis for oral anticoagulant therapy, like warfarin or coumadin. Our vitamin K-dependent procoagulants are the masters of the coagulation show. They lead the formation of three complex membrane structures, ultimately giving birth to thrombin, the protagonist of the clotting saga. Each complex comprises a vitamin K-dependent serine protease, a non-enzyme cofactor, and calcium ions. These complexes set the stage on the negatively charged phospholipid membranes of activated platelets or cells with tissue factors. It's a grand performance involving factors activated factor 7 and tissue factor, followed by activated factor 9 and activated factor 8 in the second act, and culminating in factor 10 and factor 5, transforming prothrombin into thrombin. It's a multi-step process that reveals the hero of our story, thrombin, and the thrilling prothrombin fragment 1.2, F1.2, as a marker for thrombin generation. Cofactors in hemostasis. These unsung heroes play crucial roles in orchestrating the intricate dance of blood clotting. In the coagulation saga, several key procoagulant cofactors take the stage. They interact with serine proteases, those clotting enzymes, providing stability and enhancing reactivity. Let's meet the stars of this act, tissue factor, factor 5, factor 8, and high molecular weight caninogen, HMWK. Tissue factor, like a hidden receptor, 
waits on cells outside of blood vessels, such as fibroblasts and smooth muscle cells. It's not usually seen on the inner lining of blood vessels, endothelial cells, in normal circumstances. But when a blood vessel faces injury, exposing these tissue factor-bearing cells, it activates coagulation through factor 7a, tissue factor is highly expressed in various tissues, including the brain, lungs, placenta, heart, kidneys, and testes. During inflammation and sepsis, immune cells and other cells can also join the orchestra and express tissue factor, initiating coagulation. Meet our dynamic duo, factor 5 and 8. They're soluble proteins in the bloodstream, activated by thrombin, a vital clotting enzyme, and subsequently inactivated by protein C, the regulator. Factor 5, a glycoprotein found in plasma and platelet granules, is released by platelets during activation. It transforms into activated factor 5 or factor 5A, the injury site, acting as a critical cofactor for factor XA in the prothrombinase complex. This complex speeds up thrombin generation, a pivotal player in clotting. Factor 8, on the other hand, serves as a cofactor for factor 9, working together to form the intrinsic tenase complex, which we'll explore further in the next act. Like factor V, it's activated and eventually inactivated through thrombin's involvement. HMWK stands as the guardian, a cofactor for factor 12A and precolicrian in the intrinsic contact factor complex. This complex activates coagulation when foreign objects, like mechanical heart valves, bacterial membranes, or inflammatory conditions, enter the bloodstream. It's the first responder to protect the body. In the world of coagulation, we have not only procoagulant cofactors but also regulatory ones. Thrombomodulin, a protein residing on the surface of vascular endothelial cells, serves as a cofactor for thrombin. Together, they activate protein C and thrombin activatable fibrinolysis inhibitor, TOFI, which inhibits fibrinolysis or clot dissolution. This dynamic duo helps maintain the equilibrium, ensuring coagulation doesn't go awry. Protein S and protein C are the guardians of balance in the coagulation act. Protein S, a cofactor for protein C in tissue factor pathway inhibitor, TFPI, and protein Z, a cofactor for Z-dependent protease inhibitor, ZPI, are essential for regulating and controlling coagulation. We'll dive deeper into their roles shortly. We're shining a spotlight on factor 8 and its trusty sidekick, Von Willebrand factor. These dynamic duo proteins are pivotal players in the mesmerizing world of hemostasis. So, let's dive right in. Factor 8, our first star, is no lightweight, weighing in at about 260,000 daltons. It's primarily crafted by the talented hepatocytes in your liver, but it's worth noting that tiny blood vessel cells in the lungs and various tissues, known as microvascular endothelial cells, can also produce it. Factor 8 doesn't wander alone in the bloodstream, it needs a dance partner. Enter Von Willebrand Factor, or VWF for short. They circulate hand in hand, like seasoned ballroom dancers. It's during the clotting process that the enchanting thrombin, a clotting enzyme, separates Factor 8 from VWF and activates it. Once activated, Factor 8 transforms into Factor 8 activated, and it's time to shine. It cozies up to activated platelets and, together with Factor 9 activated, in the trusty calcium ions, they form the magnificent intrinsic tenase complex. However, Factor 8 activated isn't invincible, it can be inactivated by another key player in the coagulation performance, Protein C, which helps maintain the fine balance. But what happens when there's a genetic twist in the coagulation plot? Enter hemophilia A, a genetic disorder where factor 8 takes a backstage, causing a deficiency. Since both factor 8 and factor 9 are regulated by genes on the X chromosome, this condition tends to be more common in males. People with hemophilia A experience a reduction in factor 8 activity, and the consequences can be severe, leading to significant bleeding and related symptoms. Now, let's talk about our co-star, Von Willebrand factor, VWF. This character is a versatile and complex protein with multiple roles in the clotting drama. VWF assists in platelet adhesion, helping those platelets stick together, and also acts as a trusty carrier for factor 8. VWF's complexity goes beyond the script. It's composed of smaller subunits, and these subunits combine to create even larger structures called multimers, which come in various sizes, from 600,000 to a whopping 20 million Daltons. Endothelial cells and megakaryocytes are the artists behind the scenes, producing these subunits and assembling them into multimers. As the plot unfolds, VWF reveals its importance in high-flow areas like arteries and arterioles. 
it becomes the linchpin for binding platelets to exposed collagen, that essential protein found in blood vessel walls. This dynamic interaction between VWF, platelets, and collagen is a critical moment, especially when blood races swiftly. But every good story has a twist, and here's ours, Von Willebrand disease, or VWD for short. It's a relatively common condition, affecting about 1% to 2% of the general population. In VWD, there's a decrease in VWF levels. Interestingly, VWF levels can be influenced by your ABO blood type. Folks with blood type O tend to have lower VWF levels. And it doesn't end there, VWF levels can also rise in response to factors like pregnancy, trauma, infections, and stress. Factor 11 and its trusty companions, the contact factors. These proteins may not be as famous as their coagulation peers, but their roles are equally compelling. Let's begin with the unsung heroes known as the contact factors or intrinsic accessory pathway proteins. This exclusive club consists of three members, factor 12, high molecular weight caninogen, HMWK, also known as Fitzgerald factor, and precolicrian, pre-K, also known as Fletcher factor. Why, contact factors? Well, they're known for their peculiar activation mechanism. When they touch surfaces with a negative charge, they spring into action. Factor 12 it takes pre-K, a glycoprotein, and transforms it into the dynamic calocrine. This newly minted calocrine then proceeds to cleave HMWK, crafting the remarkable molecule known as bradykinin. Factor 12 and pre-K aren't always in their active forms. They start as inactive zymogens but undergo a transformation into active serine proteases. Now, HMWK isn't quite an enzyme, but rather a trusted assistant in this intricate coagulation performance. This extraordinary ensemble, including HMWK, pre-K, and factor 12, joins forces to activate our protagonist, factor 11. When factor 11A takes the stage, it sparks the cascade, setting off factor 9, a character we've encountered earlier in our coagulation chronicle. But what if someone has a shortage of factor 12, HMWK, or pre-K? Surprisingly, it doesn't typically result in bleeding issues in real life. However, it may cause lab tests to take a tad longer, which can raise a doctor's curiosity. Factor 12 can be awakened by certain surfaces in lab tests, such as uncoated glass, kaolin, or elagic acid. Occasionally, foreign materials like stents or valve replacements can wake up these contact factors, potentially leading to unwanted blood clots. Now, let's welcome our leading role, factor 11. This protein is activated not only by the contact factor crew but also by the illustrious thrombin. Thrombin's entry into the scene marks the beginning of the clotting spectacle when tissue factor kicks off the coagulation cascade. Once factor 11A takes its place, it plays a pivotal role in setting off the well-known factor 9, a crucial component of the clotting symphony. But what happens when someone is deficient in factor 11, a condition known as Rosenthal syndrome? This can indeed lead to some bleeding issues, although they are usually not too severe. Factor 11 primarily supports factor 9, so its absence doesn't cause as much chaos as if you were missing factors 9 or 8. Thrombin. It's a versatile character with multiple roles, and it's at the heart of the clotting cascade. Thrombin is the Swiss army knife of the clotting world. It's a fibrin builder, coagulation accelerator, clot reinforcer, platelet rally leader, regulator, and the central pivot of the entire clotting system. Thrombin's primary mission is to transform the soluble fibrinogen into the insoluble fibrin, which forms the backbone of blood clots. Fibrinogen is a critical element in platelet aggregation, linking activated platelets via their GPIIB-3A receptor. Fibrinogen, the canvas for thrombin's masterpiece, is a 340,000 Dalton glycoprotein, typically found at plasma concentrations ranging from 200 to 400 mg per deciliter. In times of inflammation, infections, and stress, fibrinogen levels rise significantly. These valuable proteins are stored in platelet granules, ready to be released when the clotting alarm sounds. Fibrinogen's intricate design includes a mirror image, trinodular, dimer, composed of AA, BB, and gamma polypeptides. This is where thrombin works its magic. It snips off fibrinopeptides A and B, converting fibrinogen into fibrin monomers, setting the stage for clot formation. But thrombin doesn't stop at fibrin, it also calls upon factor 13, a heterodimer composed of alpha and beta subunits. Factor 13A's role is to bring the fibrin polymers together by creating covalent links between their D domains. 
These covalent bonds create a sturdy meshwork of fibrin polymers, adding structural integrity to the clot. Factor 13 It doesn't stop there, it interacts with other structural proteins, contributing to wound healing and tissue integrity. Factor 13A also plays a crucial role in binding fibronectin, a protein vital for cell adhesion, to the fibrin mesh, making it highly resistant to breakdown. It even extends a helping hand to plasminogen and TPA, key players in fibrinolysis, by covalently binding them to fibrin. Let's rewind to the annals of medical history. Two coagulation pathways were identified, each converging at factor 10 to ignite the common pathway, ultimately leading to thrombin production. The intrinsic pathway, often associated with factor 12 and evaluated by the APTT test, involves a lineup of factors, from 12 to fibrinogen. On the other hand, the extrinsic pathway, initiated by the tissue factor in factor 7A complex, is assessed through the PT test and features factor 7 through fibrinogen. In clinical practice, both APTT and PT tests are frequently combined to screen for coagulation factor abnormalities. Deficiencies in factors 8 and 9 can trigger severe bleeding. It's worth noting that these two pathways ultimately meet at factor 10, accompanied by factor 5, prothrombin, and fibrinogen, where the common pathway begins its dance. While the intrinsic, extrinsic, and common pathways serve as valuable tools for laboratory testing, they don't fully capture the intricate, in vivo coagulation interactions at play in the human body. Now, let's shift our focus from test tubes to the dynamic in vivo coagulation within our bodies. Here, we witness a delicate symphony of cellular and biochemical events, orchestrating a harmonious balance between keeping blood liquid during circulation, halting blood loss from injuries through thrombus formation, and facilitating the healing process. In the realm of in vivo coagulation, it's not as straightforward as the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways might suggest. These pathways are not isolated mechanisms but are intricately intertwined. Effective physiologic coagulation isn't just about plasma proteins, it also relies on tissue factor expressing cells, often located outside blood vessels, and platelets, which circulate within blood vessels. Coagulation unfolds in two distinct phases. Initiation begins on tissue factor expressing cells, contributing a modest 3 to 5% of total thrombin generated. The real show takes place in the propagation phase on platelets, accounting for a staggering 95% or more of total thrombin production. The initiation phase of the coagulation process. It's all about the extrinsic tenase complex, endothelial damage response, tissue factor, factor 7A, and the beginnings of factor activation. The initiation of in vivo thrombin generation has an exciting twist. It's primarily sparked by the formation of the extrinsic tenase complex, setting the stage for coagulation's opening act. When the endothelium takes a hit, it kickstarts a localized response. The extent of this response hinges on factors like the injury size, tissue affected, and platelet availability. Around 1-2% of factor 7A in the bloodstream is naturally activated, awaiting its cue to dance. That cue is tissue factor, supplied by fibroblasts and subendothelial cells. It acts as a cofactor for factor 7A, forming the dynamic extrinsic tenase complex, tissue factor and factor 7A. Tissue factor and factor 7A complex goes on to activate a small amount of both factor 9 and factor X. Some minimal thrombin is stirred up by membrane-bound 10A and 10A, 5A prothrombinase complexes. Now, here's the clever bit, coagulation complexes anchored to cell membranes enjoy some protection against inhibitor interference. However, if 10A, 5A ventures away from its cellular haven, it faces quick inactivation by vigilante protease inhibitors like TFPI, antithrombin, and protein Z-dependent protease inhibitor, ZPI, until a threshold level of 10A, 5A activity is achieved. In this phase, even with minimal thrombin on the scene, the stage is set for some pivotal events. Platelets come to life, thanks to protease-activated receptors. Factor V makes a dramatic entrance from platelet A granules. Factor 8 gets its moment in the spotlight, separating from von Willebrand factor. Factor 11, the intrinsic accessory procoagulant, takes its cue, setting the stage for more factor 9 action. Fibrinogen peptides A and B make their debut, creating the initial threads of a fibrin network. As fibrinopeptides are cleaved, signifying the initiation phase's end and the propagation phase's start, we often find this as the visual endpoint in many clot-based coagulation tests. Remarkably, this stage requires only a tiny fraction of the total thrombin generated, about 3%. We're diving deep into the heart-pounding world of thrombin generation, focusing on the dominant phase known as propagation. 
Picture this, over 95% of the thrilling Thrawn generation journey unfolds during the propagation phase. This is where the real magic happens. Here, reactions come to life on the surface of activated platelets, who've now got all the tools they need for coagulation. They're like the superheroes of our story, ready to save the day. These mighty platelets don't just sit around, they get into action. Activated platelets help localize the coagulation response. They adhere to the injury site and are activated by the low-level thrombin produced in the initiation phase, as well as through their adherence to exposed collagen. We often refer to them as coat platelets, signifying their partial activation by collagen and thrombin. Now, let's talk about the real stars of this show, the intrinsic tenase and prothrombinase complexes. Cofactors VA and 8A, previously activated by thrombin during the initiation phase, come to the forefront. They bind to platelet membranes, serving as receptors for 10A and 9A. 9A, produced during the initiation phase, partners with 8A on the platelet membrane, forming the intrinsic tenase complex, 9A, 8A. Platelet-bound factor 9 also chips in, contributing to the generation of more factor 9A. The intrinsic tenase complex is like the accelerator, revving up the activation of factor X, and it does so at an astonishing rate, 50 to 100 times faster than the extrinsic tenase complex. Factor 10A joins forces with VA to create the prothrombinase complex, which, in a grand finale, activates prothrombin, leading to a substantial production of thrombin. Thrombin, the multifaceted superstar of this phase, steps up to the plate. It cleaves fibrinogen to weave the intricate threads of a fibrin clot. Activates factor 13 to lend unmatched strength to the clot. Pairs with thrombomodulin, initiating the protein C control pathway. Activates toffee to stand guard against fibrinolysis, the dissolution of clots. But the magic doesn't stop there. The presence of both tissue factor-bearing cells in our valiant activated platelets is key for coagulation. This localized clotting ensures that our clot doesn't wander off and cause trouble elsewhere. And let's not forget, these pathways are a dynamic duo. While we often talk about the extrinsic pathway on tissue factor-bearing cells and the intrinsic pathway on the platelet surface, they're not separate or redundant. They work side by side until the grand finale when the control mechanisms take the stage. Keep in mind that platelets and tissue factor-bearing cells are the unsung heroes of physiological coagulation. Deficiencies in key proteins responsible for coagulation complex formation and activity can lead to significant bleeding disorders. They are the glue that holds this fascinating tale together. Stay up to date with our latest videos by hitting that subscribe button and activating notifications. Be the first to know when we release new and exciting content. Don't keep all this valuable information to yourself, share this video with your friends who might find it interesting and beneficial. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them down below. Until next time, take care and goodbye.